I would really, really like to introduce you to Emma. Um, she is the Data Protection Commissioner for the Bailwick of Guernsey. Um, and she's going to talk to you about her experiences one year post GDPR with a little bit of history um, thrown in for good measure. So if you give Emma a round of applause and um, we'll catch up later. Hopefully I've got some... Get rid of that, crikey. So are there my slides coming up somewhere? That's the one, yeah. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction, and is that all right? Sound-wise, yeah, great. Um, so uh, as I say, uh, as was already introduced, I'm Emma. I'm from uh, the Bailiwick of Guernsey. I'm the commissioner there. I've worked in data protection for a very long time, um, first as DP officer for law enforcement, and then I, again, uh, turned to uh, gamekeeper uh, and working for the regulator's office uh, many years ago. Um, Guernsey is a third country for the purposes of GDPR. We had adequacy under the previous regime, um, so we have adequacy at the moment, and we're having to resubmit um, our new legislation, which came into force on the same day as GDPR last year. Um, we're really, really small. Has anyone been to Guernsey or Jersey Channel Islands? Oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> really tiny. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say I'm a little bit apprehensive about today because we get to speak a lot in the Channel Islands. Um, so I'm from a really small jurisdiction. I don't have any tech giants uh, in the jurisdiction. I don't have any headline-grabbing stories that I can talk to you about. But we do have a lot of data. The Channel Islands has a lot of data. And I think questions around its protection uh, are as real for small communities and small regulators as they are for larger ones. So I'd like to take this opportunity, if I may, to give the discussion around data protection and data uh, a little bit of context and a bit of colour, maybe, and then talk about how we, in our office, are approaching questions of regulation. So firstly, uh, a little look back. I do quite like history, so bear with me. Um, traditional business models, certainly from a capitalist perspective, um, turn things into commodities and then bring those things into the marketplace to buy and sell and, and make profit from. And this new digital era that we find ourselves uh, immersed in um, emulates that to a certain degree in that it brings something into the marketplace um, in order to make a profit from. Only this time there's a bit of a twist because that commodity is us. Um, we are the raw material. Our data is the raw material. And this is a whole new kind of production process. And let's be clear, we're not just talking about browsing history uh, anymore, although that's an incredibly rich source of data. Anyone check their history uh, recently? It's worth doing every so often just to see what that says about you and, and what you're looking at. Um, but we're now in a world where advertising billboards use facial recognition, um, smart home meters track our movements, Fitbits track our health. Who's got one on today? Anybody? Um, we are judged depending how many exclamation marks we used in social media posts. I mean, the list really is uh, endless. So we're well beyond uh, click and browse data, if you like. This is now immersive. It's everything about us, and it's difficult, if not impossible, uh, to escape. And it's not just about making money and selling you things, although it's a lot about that. Um, but it's about now influencing and shaping our behavior in ways that sometimes we're not even aware of, and where I, I would argue there's intentional obscurity around the data collection and data handling practices. I mean, big data it really is reshaping the world. It's reshaping us, the way we work, the way we live, the way we think. Because data matters today. It matters economically, it matters uh, socially, technologically, politically, in every way uh, conceivable. It also matters not just in terms of size, because this is not just about amassing existing data. This is about rendering into data uh, aspects of the world and aspects of us that have never been quantified before. So our location, our likes, our dislikes, our preferences, our supermarket purchases, where we like to think we're going on holiday, maybe you haven't even booked it yet. So this datification, I've heard that term used a lot of our lives, this trail of information um, from us all feeding into uh, the big data world. So this is more than just uh, economics. The internet has reshaped how humanity communicates. And this layer of big data 
is different. It marks a real transformation in how society processes information. And of course, as we all know, this is only just the beginning. It's profoundly changing uh, the way that businesses, governments, politics works. And when it comes to generating uh, economic growth or providing uh, public services or fighting wars, anything, those who can harness big data will almost certainly have an advantage. Um, just a couple of headlines there, because I think it's important that we understand the vulnerabilities. There's all sorts of talk about how fantastic big data is. And now we're in an environment today of privacy professionals, so we get this. But the wider conversation about the vulnerabilities really does need to happen. We mustn't shy away from those conversations. Because automated systems are now beginning to run the show, determining what news feeds we see, what adverts we are sent, uh, how much we pay for a product. And these automated processes are no longer uh, simply tools at our disposal. They are often making the decisions themselves. They're sort of invisible chaperones, if you like, that shape our online experiences. And many of us are entirely oblivious uh, to that fact. And let's add a bit of facial recognition to the mix. Who's got one of the new phones that uses facial recognition? Anybody here? So it's very common. So it's increasingly used by governments and, and private sector. And one important point about facial recognition and other biometric data like fingerprints, for example, is that it works at a distance. So anybody with a phone can take a picture for facial recognition programs to use. And of course, our faces aren't just name tags. They display a lot of other information uh, and machines can read that too. A research program you may have heard of in the US quite recently claims to have designed a program that identifies homosexual faces. Um, extraordinary. In countries where homosexuality is a crime, I mean, that's a terrifying prospect. But of course, it also picks up ethnicity. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Bernard on the left and Dylan on the right. Has anyone seen these guys before? Yes, yeah, some of you will be familiar with this, uh, this project that went on the, in the US. But they're convicted criminals processed through the US court system for some years back now. They both committed similar crimes and they both had very similar backgrounds. When they were due to go in front of the parole board, um, they were subject of algorithms that sought to determine the likelihood of them re-offending. Bernard, on the left, scored higher than Dylan, so was seen as a greater risk. Why? Simply because of the color of his skin. So algorithms which are often so hidden uh, can have real life-changing uh, impacts. And algorithms are, of course, after all, just our own opinions, our own biases uh, embedded into code. Before you sit back uh, knowing that there's a nice comfortable distance between us and these guys here, this is about every single one of us in this room and beyond every single day. Because we are undoubtedly seeing sort of the normalization in society of things like facial recognition and AI sitting behind it. So last month we saw the first legal challenge to the routine capture of images uh, facial images of shoppers. It also saw a man extraordinarily fined for covering his face as he walked past a police facial recognition trial in London. Don't know if you've heard about that case. And extraordinary, he just he saw that the trial uh, police vehicle and thought, I know I don't want to be captured by this. So he pulled his jumper up and he was arrested and fined. So it seems that opting out is not an option, um, or only to the extent that you're happy to be criminalised, um, or unless of course you live in San Francisco that have recently uh, largely banned the technology. So you're all privacy professionals. Just think for a moment about some of the behind the scenes processing that is going on in respect of all that te technology. Um, has anyone come across the Moral Machine website? Hands up if you have. You're good, oh, you should be up here. <laughs> He's got hands up every time. I'm really pleased you haven't because I would urge you, if there's only one thing you take away from what I say to you, is just have a look at this website. Uh, preferably not now, because I'd like you to focus on what I'm saying. But in the coffee break or this evening, it's an amazing website. It's, it puts you in charge of decisions that a driverless car, which you can see at the top here, um, has to make in the event of an unexpected incident. So it has to uh, break quickly or something walks in front of it. Um, this is just one scenario, so the, the driverless car has no time to stop, um, but will either hit a, an obstacle or will hit uh, five, I think, children. What do you want them to do? What do you want the car to do? Because someone has to program it to make that decision, because if it goes into the wall or the obstacle, it may kill the five passengers in the vehicle. 
Um, the website is, it has a few of these different scenarios, all different. They talk about whether you're going to run over a dog or a cat, so it gets to the very heart of what you, what you like and don't like as a human being. But also age, how old are the people that you're potentially killing in the programming of this vehicle. So really fascinating. So it's, but it's not just a frivolous exercise, I would argue. Um, look at the conversations in Germany. I'm not sure how clear uh, this is, but this is um, an article uh, that covers the discussion of this issue, the driverless cars in Germany. And one German politician said that the, 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 the cars should never distinguish between humans based on categories such as age or race. Just think for a moment about what that's pointing to. Those cars, these cars will and do indeed have the ability to do just that. It's pretty sobering, I, I would suggest. And a year ago on the radio, I heard an, an eminent uh, female AI researcher suggesting that people should be warned if the house that they go in has um, an Echo or a uh, Google Chrome or other digital assistant um, saying that when she knows they are there, she holds a much more guarded, uh, careful conversation. She's always conscious that her words were being listened to and dissected and, and used. The interviewer, I noticed, it was very subtle, um, but the interviewer was, was treating her with, with, with a, almost a contempt, really, and it joked at one point that maybe she expected privacy policies, which we're all so familiar with these days, to be taped to the door of her friends' houses before she went in. Um, so she was, meted, she was greeted with a sort of sense of, of humour, that it was quite funny what she was saying, um, but also a sense that she was showing sort of exaggerated concerns, sort of tinfoil hat time. But of course, more, frequent, more recently, we've, we've seen how invasive these assistants actually are and have the potential to be, with stories emerging of, of the collection of more data than maybe we realised, as well as the fact that snippets of these conversations are being listened to by humans. And again, mo the friends, my friends who've got these really don't, didn't understand that, didn't think that was, that was happening. So it's the, um, the expectation is not being matched by the reality. So even something as seemingly as innocuous as price discrimination, whether it's your car insurance or, or a package holiday that you're looking to go on, can point to a much more profound, and I would argue dis disturbing uh, social policy concern here. Who is being discriminated against and why? I mean, if we're talking about paying more for a holiday, I mean, that's bad enough, but if it's feeding into a system that will potentially weigh up your worth for the programming of driverless cars, well, that's another thing, I would suggest. I think in the small data era, privacy was one of the central challenges, but the big data era, the challenge really is going to be safeguarding ourselves as, as human beings, our free will, our moral choice, human volition, human agency. So what do we do about all this stuff? Well, in advanced technologies, uh, advanced democracies, forgive me, at least, legislation um, seeks to embed a set of principles around how personal data is to be handled. And most of us here, I think, live in, in jurisdictions that provide strong legal rights in this area. I think sometimes uh, we do take that for granted. Um, if you ever, for a brief moment, wonder whether you are making a difference as a privacy professional or whether any of this is worth it, with the words of someone somewhere saying, privacy is dead, get over it in the, in the history. Um, I would just urge you to have, uh, recall in your mind um, this photograph, because um, this is a photograph, um, that it's actually on the front of, the, of this book. And it seems very apt because we've got the 75th anniversary uh, of D-Day th this week. Um, this the front of this book, and this is about the Nazi census and how this is, this is a, a women in Nazi Germany collecting census data and recording data about the Jewish community um, and explores how it used, how the Nazi regime used data collection uh, as a tool. Um, and there's one uh, lovely quote in here. It's very well, much worth the read, this book. I've got it if anyone wants to have a little look afterwards and make a note of it. It's quite hard to find. This is a, one from an old library. Um, in it, they say, is not the simple abstraction of humans into mere numbers a fundamental assault on their dignity? And, and this book explains in graphic detail what the awful outcome of that, that use of data and that manipulation of data was. So if you're ever in any doubt that any of this matters, you don't have to look too far back in history. And it's no accident that Germany has some of the toughest laws across Europe in this respect. And it's always important for us to remember 
who, who, spend our who spend our lives, professional lives, working to uphold data protection, that where this, some of this comes from and what the world looks like in the absence of it. Uh, so law gives individuals control. I don't need to tell it, you any of this. You're, you're well familiar with it. Access rights um, requires accountability and processing. Those are really, really important uh, aspects of legislation. And of course, the law is, a really, um, is an opportunity for the state, the government, to impose these tough principles uh, into law with penalties. But it was touched on in the intro, but it does go beyond law, I think. And this is where we all have a part to play as well. Because... Playing by the rules is really it's the beginning. So you, play, you, you do what the law requires you to do. But that's just the beginning. It has to just be the beginning. Because it's never going to be enough to deliver what's needed in this environment. And one thing that struck me recently was how interwoven this whole area of data protection, especially, and this whole conversation around uh, data has become a, with question, how embedded it is with the questions of ethics. The question of what is right and wrong, not simply a question of what is lawful and unlawful. And I think it will become even more so as data uh, processing impacts our lives more and more, and we get better at understanding what those impacts are and consequences are. And ethics, uh, in my view, certainly, is what's been missing in some of these conversations, especially when we look back at the birth of some of the big tech giants. Things were done because they could be, move fast, break things, and that's fine to a point, but when we're talking about our lives, our society, our democracy, we need a different perspective. We also need to demand different standards. So ethics should inform the legislation, but it should also go beyond the law as well. So as a regulator charged with oversight of this legislation, um, what is our approach to uh, regulation? Well, I think most regulators, whatever it is they do, will, will largely have four uh, broad areas of activity. So the prediction and prevention of harms, and then the detection and enforcement uh, if things uh, and when things go wrong. There's an awful lot of noise around uh, enforcement and fines, and that's understandable. GDPR has been and continues to be a game changer in this respect with, with tough fines and tough enforcement. But we do need, I think, to go beyond quite narrow conversations about uh, only fines and only enforcement, because they are a, a part of the picture and they're a really important part, but they're not the only thing that should drive uh, this conversation. Because when we obsess about breaches, when we obsess about enforcement and fines and how much money people are going to be fined, the harm's already done. So we're focusing on harms that have happened and damage done in, in the data world is really hard to undo. And it's also true that detection isn't easy and it's expensive, often relying on whistleblowers or journalists or individuals for whom something has already gone wrong. And if as a regulator we focus entirely on these areas, we become very reactive, very backward looking. And this environment is moving way too fast and the stakes are too high for that to be an effective model of regulation, in my view. Resources are finite for every regulator large and small. So we need to be smart about how we use them. We want good outcomes, but what does a good outcome look like? We need to make people aware. People, There was a lot of talk around GDPR last year, but does that influence behavior? It's all very well to know something, but does it actually change people's, the way that people are interacting with data and handling data? Does it improve those outcomes? We want compliance to become naturally embedded. It's a cultural issue and needs to be culturally accepted and culturally demanded uh, as well. And we want to make the right behaviour the easiest behaviour and the most desirable behaviour. Like any other regulator, we have a very wide regulator community from large finance houses to small local hairdressers. And that brings with it uh, really unique challenges challenges of how best to communicate, uh, to engage, and we don't have all the answers to that. Um, but we don't want to become disconnected from our community because we don't necessarily have all the answers. I want us to be thoughtful and effective and engaged with our regulator community and to recognise and value them for their contributions and, and engagement and feedback. Because fundamentally, I believe that most people do want to do the right thing. I think most of you in this room, if you're a data protection officer for an organisation, you probably want to do the right thing, I would suggest. And just to explore that a little bit more, it's a random slide, forgive me. Just a little story about I was traveling through airport security um, quite recently, um, and the woman in front of me had left a water bottle in her bag. Anyone ever done that heinous crime if you're going through any London airport? 
Um, and what struck me was how aggressive the two security people were uh, when this was discovered, uh, how aggressive they were to her. And then the sort of hangover of aggression when I turned up, and I, you know, I'm really well behaved. I travel quite a lot, so I have my little bag, my toiletries, my iPad out, no belt. I'm really, really well behaved, and I'm just waiting there obediently. But this sort of wave of anger and aggression, sort of simmering uh, anger and aggression. Uh, this poor woman in front of me um, was clearly mortified and upset by it. And just in that moment, I, I observed how I'm normally quite a pacifist, but I really wanted to deck these guys, I have to say. So observing how that made me feel in that moment of my life gave me a sudden clarity, really, about how I wanted to approach regulation in this area, sort of to build up a, reg a regime that assumes the community wants to do the right thing, the sense that we're all actually after the same thing. Because in that moment at the airport, I want to travel safely. The airport security people want me to travel safely. So if we're after the same thing, how come it felt so angsty? Um, I want the bad guys stopped as well. That's the important point. Um, but I also make mistakes sometimes. I might leave a water bottle or what, a lipstick or whatever it is in the place that it doesn't, it's not meant to be. And I want to be clear, this is not about not being tough on bad actors. We need to be tough on them, and the law gives us the tools to do that. But simply that there's a difference between someone going through security with a weapon and someone going through with a forgotten water bottle. And if you treat them all the same, there will be a big disconnect. Um, and I, um, I think that, that uh, a big part of preventing that disconnect is about encouraging a real understanding of what we're all actually after, why this matters to us as human beings, first and foremost, and individuals, but also to the success of our businesses and therefore the success of our economy. And then how we can successfully deliver on those obligations. And then as, as a regulator, it's how we regulate that environment in a way that's consistent and accountable uh, and ethical. Because data protection is no longer an IT problem that it used to be in the past. It's a business performance, business success, business failure issue. But it's also an issue of democracy, uh, of dignity, autonomy. In fact, it's hard to think of any area of our lives um, uh, that it doesn't uh, affect in some way, shape, or form. And that any area of our lives that is not somehow influenced by uh, what happens to the data, the vast amounts of data, powering decisions and events around us every minute of the day. But the environment is changing faster than the law. I mean, GDPR took years. If anyone was following it from its, the, uh, the first thoughts about it, it was a very, very long time, awful lot of lobbying. And in that time, technology changed what it was dealing with. The technology had changed already. Um, so in doing things well, I mean, drafting good laws, GDPR, I don't know what, whether you think it's good or bad or, or indifferent, but nonetheless, it, it, it has its challenges, but it's a, it's a decent set of principles. And that took time to get uh, into a fit state to, to, to roll out to Europe. So that's why, again, this goes well beyond uh, legislation. And I really want to explore the issue for a, a moment about the time and friction. Um, did anyone hear the story about the nest? There is a smart home system. Some of you may have uh, nest systems. Um, and this is a, a case in the US where uh, a family had a nest system, and the, the young uh, toddler, I think, was, was screaming out in the night uh, that there were monsters in her room. And the mother was, for weeks and weeks, was saying, no, don't worry, darling, go back to sleep. And then one evening, again, some of you may have heard this quite recently, she went into the room and heard a voice coming through the nest system. And it was a paedophile uh, grooming gang that were talking through these systems to the child. Um, but I want to, just talking about the, the time and the friction point here, that Nestor really admitted that um, they effectively chose to let some hackers slip through the cracks rather than impose an array of inconvenient countermeasures that could detract from their users' experience and ultimately alienate their customers. Um, I just want to think about that for a second because sometimes friction the time it takes to do something is a good thing for us. It's a good thing for us as human beings. It's a good thing for us as business leaders. Because doing things in a careful and considered manner can often lead to better long-term legal and ethical outcomes with individuals and society uh, better protected as a result. And I'll just give you two rather well, random examples. But stopping at a traffic light um, is inconvenient. It delays me from getting where I need to go. 
but it stops me from crashing into other cars, it stops me from running other pedestrians over, and it protects me and protects them. When a surgeon scrubs up, it sure takes time to do, but it makes sure that the patient is protected. There are so many areas of our lives where we not only tolerate friction, we expect it and demand it. So why, when it affects us so profoundly, do we not demand better for our data? When I'm asked what has GDPR done in its first year, I have to answer that at an operational level, we are just beginning the journey of regulatory reform. I'm sure you'll see some large fines issued as regulators begin to flex their muscles, but these are still very early days. Um, but this question goes beyond law. Uh, so let's celebrate the anniversary and birthday of GDPR, but let's also think more broadly about this. Because I think we are starting to see a, a shift in public discourse, a recognition that this whole area Got that. Sorry, forgive me. This whole area really affects us in uh, profound ways, and we need to take ownership of that. This is not just a job for governments or for regulators or for laws or for DPOs. It's a job for every single one of us. Um, I was at a, a cafe recently with my daughter, and uh, she's 12, and the, the drink arrived, and there was a plastic straw in it. And she looked at it with absolute horror. Um, she queried to me why they'd given her a plastic straw. I mean, it was as if they'd given her a glass of green slime to drink. Um, but then I thought as well that this sense of, and she, you know, I'm, not, I'm not out on the streets uh, pro protesting with the London protests about um, green, sorry, I've been told to, to wrap it up, so I will. I'm not very good at <laughs> multitasking, talking, and getting messages. Um, but the sense that it's culturally, she just, that, that, that concern she had about the plastic straw was, was cultural. Um, it wasn't the law. She wasn't aware that the law was wanting to change about plastics. She was aware that culturally this is becoming unacceptable and to listen to David Attenborough and so forth. So we need the same for data. So in the world of big data, it's the human traits that need to be fostered, creativity, intuition, intellectual ambition, uh, morality and ethics. It's humans, it's you and I that are the source of progress here. Because if Henry Ford had queried in the early 1900s, big data algorithms to ask his clients what they wanted, he would have just simply developed faster ones of these. And when I ask Siri, Siri, are you cleverer than me? The answer is, mm, that's something I don't know. Well, she should know because you and I are far cleverer than she will ever be because algorithms don't know anything in a true sense. The biggest amount of data you can gather is simply human beings, us. So in this discussion, let's get the detail right, let's get GDPR right, but more importantly, let's keep the conversation human, recognising what an important part we all play. We must use it appreciating its uh, power, but also its imperfections. Uh, we need to maintain the momentum here, and those of you that follow Tim Berners-Lee, um, the inventor of the World Wide Web, a lovely quote from him uh, to, that we all have a role to play here. So as data professionals, Let's not assume that only those working in large jurisdictions and large organisations uh, have the power to make a difference and have a, uh, entitled to have a voice in this. And going back to the beginning when I mentioned a slight sense of, of uh, and, uh, apprehension about being here, just very last, lastly a quote for us all. I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. Thank you very much and sorry for going over. I'm not going to let her run away without a couple of Sorry, questions. Fierce um, guy in the back. I've gone over time. I've been terribly oh, no, guilty. Don't worry. Don't worry. You started <laughs> late. That's fine. And I'm in charge. Liam can behave himself. Um, so um, I have a question for you. Um, those of us in the room, we're data savvy. We know. Do you think that potentially um, if we, we as data protection professionals don't keep an eye on this, we will end up with the data savvy haves and the non-data savvy have-nots. And for anybody who, like me, occasionally has to do IT over the phone with your mother-in-law um, <laughs> and who knows nothing, do you think that we're at that tipping point? I think we're already there. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's the conversation I have with friends who say, well, I've got nothing to hide, therefore I've got nothing to fear. And I think that some of this is about really powerful education messages. Some of this is going to be about getting fingers burned and then realising what the harms actually look like. But it's, it's a combination of things. The law needs to get it right, first and foremost, because things need to work outside of people's uh, ability to engage with the law themselves. Um, but 
education, empowerment, are really tough, they're really tough questions. Um, but the more we see, there's sort of a, a data breach fatigue going on. People say, oh, another one. Oh, my data's gone again, or oh, never mind. It just, there's a danger of that as well. But no, that, that's a huge problem for, for any regulator. And any so do you think people, there's a lack of understanding of quite how much data is going into the hands of so few companies? I think it's a lack of understanding of that, but also a lack of understanding of potential consequences of that. And facial recognition, it's greeted as a, a great new technology, but what are the consequences later on down the line if your insurance company gets hold of it and thinks, well, that person's more likely to get that medical condition when they're 50, therefore I won't insure them. It's sort of the, the, the um, delayed consequences as well that people really need to engage with, which are tough. So, as a regulator, do you have a worry that, um, that in a dash to do the most innovative new thing, facial recognition, I see a lot of that in the events industry. They go, oh, let's do facial recognition. And you go, right, you've got to have a DPO. And they go, I don't want one. Yeah. And that's the point I was making about friction, that sometimes yes. we, we just need to... It's not about not doing things at all, but it's about making sure that there's privacy built in, which is what GDPR yes. wants to see. But too often it comes as a bolt-on, and that's never going to work. And, and with, the, with regards to friction, cookie, cookie consent is a big friction thing. Um, and you, uh, But some companies will keep asking you, and you can, but you're, you're, you're instilling friction where if I said I didn't want it once, then don't ask me every time I come back. Yeah. This is a huge subject, isn't it? And I, and I, I think sometimes that there is um, that opaqueness around cookie collection, that, yeah. that it's, it's putting people off from engaging with the actual question. So maybe that's those are areas that we need to get companies better at just handling data in a decent and ethical way, rather than pushing that question to the data subject yeah. to make decisions that they're not either informed to make or can't, don't have the time to make. So this, it's, yeah. a, it's a combination. It's a, it's a big puzzle with lots of pieces, I think. Does anybody else have a question for Emma? Really a quick question to follow up on those cookies. From a regulator, regulator's perspective, how are you looking at the cookie consent aspect? Because it is a consent by accepting, but consent has to be freely given. And you can't, you don't have the option to decline cookies nine times out of ten. So how, how is that progressing? Forward? Yeah, and that's sort of the point I was trying to make just then. It's about the underlying and embedded legislation underneath that and about what the companies can and can't do. I mean, we're very fortunate. We, I mean, I, I recognise how fortunate I am being in a jurisdiction where we've got very compliant controllers. We've got some large controllers in our, in our jurisdiction. So I probably don't have the experience of dealing with the big players that maybe will will take advantage of, of the, 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 the complexity around cookies and the complexity around what consent actually looks like. Um, because I think that we have got organisations in our jurisdiction that understand that. And it, it, I think I, I hate seeing this question of consent pushed out to individuals and then the company just throws their hands up and says, well, that's, that's me done. I can do what I like then with the data. I don't think that washes anymore. So I think the underlying uh, legislation and rules around what they then do with that data becomes really important. But as I said, there's no, there's no single answer to any of this stuff. It's, it's tough. And that's where we, you know, individuals need to be empowered, but also um, regulators need to do their job.